uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our house, which is actually everyone's house, um, but to Rare and Special Collections and to Roar. Um, I'm uh, Colleen Cook, I'm the Dean of the McGill Library, and we're very fortunate to have you here, and we're very fortunate to have our guests here. And um, I just wanted to say hello. Um, we're about doing all sorts of wild and crazy things, renovating and renewing our library, and, and programming such as this is an integral part of that. But I don't want to get between you and the fun things like all of these herbs here, which I adore myself. So um, they will, then we've got people here who can tell you about it. And I will hand it over to, to Natalie Cook, the Associate Dean for Roar. Thank you very much. You need to have the last name Cook, by the way, to work in this library. <laughs> We are very excited to have you here today. We, we cooked up this idea you know, a, a while back when I was speaking with Susan and Julia. We thought what fun it would be to have um, a panel on public markets to celebrate the coming of spring. And we didn't know that we could time it so well with the weather. Um, yeah. But it's worked out very, very well. We do these community events in ROAR, which is an acronym for the rare and special collections units in the library because we have been collecting things at McGill for over 200 years. And instead of just keeping the treasures hidden to ourselves, we like to think of events and ways that we can share them and actually reach out to the public and talk about the treasures we have and that this is a public resource. And so this is an example of one of our community events where we've been able to share some of our treasures and interest you in them. So you'll find a pop-up exhibit back here with some seed catalogs. You'll find some fabulous old pictures of markets at the back on the touch table. And when you go in to enjoy some food afterwards, you're going to be seeing a PowerPoint with various images that we have collected. There's some very interesting things, including an image of a very flooded bicycle market in 1886, if I remember it which tells you that floods are not something just of our current time, but actually are something that we've experienced in Montreal in the past. So um, we are thankful to so SHRC, the Social Sciences and Humanities um, Council of Canada, who's given us a grant to be able to hold these kinds of public events. Um, and we are very grateful to be able to do this in the library. So welcome. Before I introduce our moderator, I have a few um, housekeeping tips. So first off, the washrooms, if you need them, are outside the door to the left and left again. And there are single stall washrooms up on the sixth floor, as well as other washrooms on the fifth floor. Um, after, after the event, we're going to invite you to look at the, the photo exhibit and also the touch table. But we will ask that you please keep your um, drinks and food in the reading room. That is, we want to protect our art in the art gallery outside. So we want to make sure that the food and drink doesn't go outside, please. Um, and we also have some wonderful pictures and photographs here that capture the area's ethnic diversity. And these are by a Montreal photographer named Eva Monica Zabrowski, who is actually here with us this evening, I believe. Are you here? Hi. There we are. There's, there's a photographer. So there's some beautiful photographs that we're going to show you here. Um, that's going to be um, available for viewing until August the 16th, so for quite a while. And then refreshments will be served after the panelists have spoken. Okay. Now I'm going to introduce our fabulous moderator, who in turn will introduce the panel. Our books are heavy, so that's why I'm... <laughs> So Julia, Julian Armstrong is a friend of mine, and she's a, a, a very well-known and very well-loved food writer and journalist in Quebec. She probably knows more about Quebec foodways than anybody. She has a healthy sense of humor. Um, she has a, a, well, a wicked sense of humor, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you'll have a lot of fun with her as a moderator. She has two very popular books. Her first was A Taste of Quebec. And her second is made in Quebec. This is a treasure, by the way. There's some recipes in here that are absolute killers. This is not my copy because mine is sitting at home in the kitchen. And thank goodness one of the audience members brought one and I was able to pounce on it. 
there's a recipe in here for tartuf sirop d'érable, which is absolutely <coughs> the best. So if you do get a chance to buy a cookbook, that's well worth it. You also won't have a chance to buy this book because it's sold out. This is Susan Sevenak's book on Marché Jantel, but I wanted to show it. So um, Julian has been involved in founding Taste Canada. She has been a journalist for the Montreal Evening Standard and for the Gazette. You've, you, you've seen her columns in multiple different ways, and you've heard her voice as she's been telling us what to shop for and how to prepare things in Quebec, and we are delighted that she was willing to be convinced to come and be the moderator for this fabulous panel. So I'm turning it over to her. I'm in print media, so tell me if this works. Will you someone on the back? Louise, is it working? Um, it's a huge pleasure to be here. Uh, one reason is that these kindly librarians, when I moved house two years ago, came over and adopted most of my cookbook collection. A couple of truckloads, I think. And it was great to think that they were going somewhere where they might be used. I still have another load. <laughs> I, I started working on other libraries for them. Uh, it's a huge pleasure to be at uh, this wonderful library. The, the, the collection is so precious that I'm not exactly sure where it is, but I think it's locked away somewhere. Is that right, Natalie? They can't just leaf through it while they're here. Your, right? coll your collection is sitting in No, I'm not worried about my collection. I know about them. <laughs> it's your collection. <laughs> Let me start by interviewing a longtime colleague, Susan Seminac. I'm sorry, I've got to hold this right like this, eh? Just help me if I go off my Is it all right? A food writer who had, gives the most marvelous dinner parties, uh, all home cooked and some of it home grown, a journalism teacher and a mosaic artist. This is a, this is a Renaissance girl. She, she, she's published two cookbooks. This one that is unfortunately out of print, Market Chronicles. She's just published a new one about Montreal's winter cuisine, which is only in French, but is available. And um, she has been writing for the Gazette for not as long as I have, eh? but quite a long time, a good time. We, we used to fight over some of the good stories when we were both full time. Uh, she's also been in the National Post, the Toronto Star, Maclean's Magazine, and the International Herald Tribune. And she does food styling, which is one reason why I think she brought these beautiful looking herbs. The food looks so pretty, and when Susan puts it in a photo, it looks its best. Um, when you, if you get lucky and you run into her in Jean Talon Market, she walks around with you and she knows every single vendor. And you get into these wonderful conversations. We, you took a group, several groups around the market. I don't know whether you still do that. But she knows Mr. Beery, he's the big Italian guy in the overalls. Uh, who else? Let me think. Um, the potato man. <laughs> Every kind of color to potato. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a revelation. <laughs> the celery guy? This is another market shopper. Uh, I, I, want you, I want her to tell us about Jean Talon Market. So thank you so much for coming. Before you do anything, I want you to take a deep breath. So I stopped at the market, John Tello Market, on the way here, and I bought a huge tree of rosemary and some sage and some pineapple sage and chili peppers. And to me, that's this real start of spring, so I wanted to share with you. You never need a calendar at the market. Just a couple of weeks ago, the temporary walls that surround Jean Talon Market in winter came down. That's always the surest sign of spring in Montreal. Um, that and the Cap des Neiges that arrived from the gas bay as soon as the ice melts. And today, when I got there, there were baskets of the last fiddleheads from the forest and the first asparagus from the gardens. There were spring onions and lettuce, anything that can tolerate a little bit of chill in the evening. It's May in Montreal. 
and soon there'll be strawberries and then zucchini flowers and finally apples and pumpkins and root vegetables and squash. But so let's get ahead of ourselves. Let's slow things down and savor spring. That's the joy and the beauty of the market. You can follow the seasons there week by week and in the exciting intoxicating days of high summer, even day by day. Um, when I lead tours of the market, I start John Tello Market, which is my specialty. Uh, I start by telling people that this is one of my favorite places on earth. They always look a little puzzled. Um, there's nothing fancy about John Tello Market. No grand entrance, no serious architecture. Though it has become one of Montreal's most popular uh, tourist attractions and maybe one of its most beloved um, landmarks, there's still something rough and tumble about that market, something intimate, and that's what I love best about it. The market is, above all, a meeting place, as it always has been. In its beginnings in the 1930s, farmers from the surrounding countryside would turn up on weekends at what was then a bus depot. Um, and they'd have their trucks loaded with whatever fruit and vegetables that had just come out of their fields, and also eggs and squawking chickens and sheep or goats. And thus began an exchange of food and cultures that still, to this very day, makes Montreal a model of cultural diversity. The French-Canadian farmers brought their carrots, their potatoes, their apples, standard northern climate fare. But in the backyard garden surrounding Jean Talon Market, the Italian immigrants who had settled here were growing strange and unusual new exotic vegetables that no one had ever heard of. Basil, hot peppers, arugula, eggplants. Pretty soon these too were for sale at the market as the vendors and the gardeners, uh, the vendors took some of the gardener's surpluses, and as the Italian gardeners themselves began to rent stalls. And with successive waves of immigration to Little Italy, new foods are always arriving as the neighborhood changes. If you visit these days, you'll find halal butchers, a Mexican taqueria, Tunisian, Italian, Thai grocers, a Vietnamese spring roll stand, a Syrian restaurant. The market is also a place for people from the city and the country to come together which seems to me more important now than ever when we are divided on so many political and social issues. I buy my produce from farmer Daniel Bray, and he tells me how his Quebecois grandmother roasted garlic, and I share with him my Ukrainian grandmother's borscht recipe. Over at Jill Remyard's stand, I come to understand fully the misery of a wet spring and the growing calamity of climate change. Liette Lozon showed me how to thump a watermelon to listen for its music. A clear, hollow tonk is what you're after. René Lussier once told me how he gets up at three every day during the height of summer to cross the Mercier Bridge before morning traffic. And I have not questioned the price of a basket of radishes or strawberries ever since. <laughs> <laughs> this give and take between sellers and buyers fosters community. My weekly treks to the market never seem like errands, but more like little adventures. I know the vendors and they know me. There's a snippet or two of conversation, a slice of apple or a just dug radish. Here, try this, they'll say. I've come to realize that these exchanges, they're not just pleasantry. They are real and concrete ways of fostering biodiversity, too. Look around next time you go to a market, to Jean Tello Market. You'll see more varieties of potatoes, apples, lettuces than you ever find at the supermarket. And that's because grocery chains buy from distributors who buy mostly from large industrial farms. Their goal is to provide a steady supply of tried and true varieties. Not too many. They're too big to take chances. But the small scale <coughs> farmers who come to the market are more inclined to take risks on new things or on old heirloom varieties. They can plant a few rows of Rosinette or Northern Spy alongside the Cortlands and, and Empires in their orchard and see how things go. They'll bring them to the market and gauge consumer reaction. Here, try this, they'll say. And if the new offerings are a hit, the farmer plants more. Indeed, that's just how multicolored carrots came to be so popular. Until about a decade ago, just about every carrot sold in Montreal, across the world maybe, was orange. But one of Gilles Remiard's customers told him about the carrots from his village in France that were multicolored, orange, yellow, purple, magenta even. 
Remyard, whom I've nicknamed the experimentalist, did some research that winter and found heirloom seeds for three colored carrots. He planted them the next spring and they were an instant hit. And they have been a mainstay in markets all over Montreal ever since. As it turns out, the ubiquitous orange carrot is not the original carrot. Carrots for centuries were many colored, but in the 17th century, Dutch growers cultivated, cultivated orange carrots as a tribute to William of Orange, who led the struggle for <laughs> Dutch independence, and the color stuck. I encourage you all to go poke around the market, see what's new, what's old, talk to the vendors, share your own stories, breathe deep, walk slowly, bring home something you've never tasted before. Enjoy. Our next speaker is a chef who claims he was shopping at the market long before he started chefing, David Ferguson. <laughs> I was reminiscing with David today how I first met him. I'd gone with a photographer at Eau de Pied de Cochon, and we were waiting for Martin Picard to appear from somewhere, some story, I can't remember what. Martin Picard, you probably all know about his restaurants, quite unusual. And I could hear English being spoken behind the counter. This was bizarre. It was David. He was working there. You had a stash, I think, hey, for a period of time. You were a full time. Yeah. 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 Anyway, we became friends. We got in a conversation. I think it was with Richard Arliss, who's a, a good communicator of a photographer. We worked together a lot on food stories. Anyway, he is now the chef owner of Restaurant Gus. It's a 30-seat bistro in La Petite Patrie. Now, if you don't know that place, it's just next to Little Italy, north of Mile End. Is that right? Yeah. I tried, Bobian. yeah, Bobian, on Bobian Street. You can always park on Bobian. You can't always, <laughs> you can't always get a seat at his restaurant oh, because there's only 30 <laughs> seats. <laughs> Better to phone first. He studied classic French cuisine at the Stratford Chef School in Stratford, Ontario. And then he worked in New Mexico, and he traveled in Mexico before coming to Montreal. And he likes to add spices and peppercorns to some classic French dishes. And I once, in one of the many interviews I've done with David, because he really is a good talker, oh, no. as well as a good cook. <laughs> well, if you people wonder why the chef, certain chefs appear in the media quite often, it's because they can't just cook, they can talk. <laughs> we have to have talk. Uh, he, he calls his cuisine French-based with a Latin accent. He, his, start, his first restaurant was the Jolly Foo, and then he got smart and he downsized. It says, this is a more manageable size, and you may have read about him regularly in the winter because he, he runs an annual winter sock drive for the homeless. David, tell us about you and your restaurant. Okay. Well, You're on. Oh, I don't. Yeah, you don't need this. Okay. Can I just? Yeah. 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 I, I, I'm not going to focus on the restaurant because. Right. Sorry, that's. Thank you very much. Uh, microphone. Yeah. Can you hear? Oh, can you hear me? No. Oh, no. Try this one on. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, that's weird. Okay. <laughs> Good evening. I'm pleased here to be tonight at the McLaughlin McGill Library. As my story with the Jean Talon Market begins here, McGill University. I studied philosophy at McGill in the early 90s, and it was at this time I began my love, I began my love of cooking. After classes, I would walk up Saint Laurent and stop in at the various butcher shops, epiceries, fruiteries, bakeries, purchasing my nightly supper, or better yet, my nightly experiment. <laughs> at, each of, at each of the purveyors, I would ask them, how should I cook this? What is this for? What culture eats this? Invariably, they had the answers. As my interest in cooking grew, I began to, I, I began to use my student loans to purchase cooking equipment <laughs> and cookbooks. <laughs> Julia Childs, mastering of French cooking, found a place beside Heidegger's being in time. <laughs> my shopping went further afield. Weekends were reserved for the Jean Talon market. Living on the, on the plateau at the time, and being an Anglo, 
meant that Jean Talon Market was a destination that had to be discovered with a guide. My guide at the time was my friend Hélène. She showed me the different shops, made the translations, and was filled with more enthusiasm for the produce than I'd ever imagined a person could have. In the end, I married her. <laughs> it was at the John Talon Market. I would do my required shopping for the recipes I was trying to conquer, and the inspiration for what I might try next. All the time, I kept asking the purveyors my questions. What is this? What do I do with it? And it was in the answers that I began to understand what a market is. <coughs> a market is a holding of living knowledge or a library, such as this. Often, the response to my questions began with, we like to prepare it in such and such a fashion. The we being the ethnic culture he or she saw themselves in. Then as the answer continued, it introduced other cultures. The French like to put it in desserts, and the Greeks eat it on Easter. This pragmatic, pragmatic deliverance of information went from a simple answer on how to cook something to an avenue into, into varied cultures. Through their daily interactions, the purveyors learned and taught how different cultures ate and lived. Moreover, they also understood all the different names the same product was called in many languages. This is how markets have always functioned. From the time of Constantinople on the Adriatic Sea, bringing the East and West together, markets have always been a place where cultures, languages, and ideas are shared. But this cultural exchange is not the purpose of a market. The purpose of a market is to buy and sell goods. So why is this exchange so vibrant? The simple answer is in the business creed, know your client. Through the vendor's desire to sell to everyone, a great deal of knowledge of varied cultures have to be absorbed and then employed. To know how another culture cooks a food item is not only interesting, it is also good business it's also good business practice. In the end, the, the market becomes a wealth of knowledge, like a library. Another aspect of the market that I find fascinating is how food, produce, and, and, and ingredients bring so many cultures, religions, nationalities, languages, and lifestyles all together. There is no other institution that does this. I often see the market as a watering hole where all the different animals, some friends, some foes, come to drink. <laughs> to have their daily sustenance. Houses of worship, schools, food, stale, food stores, all specialize in one or another culture and in turn function separately from one or another. And restaurants also generally cater to one culture at a time. They are categorized by their cultural style of cooking. Something that I personally have problems with as my restaurant blurs the lines and people have a hard time finding the right category for it. But regardless of the cookbook you are using, be it in French or in Indian, all the ingredients can be found at the market. Food is the great equalizer. One may buy a dry date for a traditional French stuffing, or one might buy the same date to break the fast in the time of Ramadan. Where you buy the date from is not important beyond its quality. Therefore, the market provides a place for all people to indulge in and practice their, all, their own given cultures. No other institution permits this or enables such a pluralistic act in our society. Different people may meet on a soccer pitch or in a political forum, but in these places they are participating in the cultures of sports and politics. The market is not only where many cultures meet, but is where they find their sustenance, their participation, and their expression of their own given culture. On a side note, I've always found it interesting how Quebec nationalism is on full display at our markets. 
long before the local food moment, of food movement, sorry, or the 100 mile diet, or Quebec vi uh, vendors proudly labeled produce as coming from Quebec, as they should. Being from Ontario, this struck me as odd, <laughs> as Ontario producers rarely featured in markets back in the 90s. Now they, now they do it. But. <laughs> but as we know, food is integral to a community, a culture, and a nation. One can argue over the merits of Quebec nationalism, but one cannot argue over the greatness of Lac Saint Jean blueberries. <laughs> yeah. But most importantly, the Jean Talon market is a place of commerce, where one, in my case, buys lows and sells high. When I go to the market today, as a, per as a business person, well, I try to sell high. <laughs> This always is at the forefront of my mind. Yes, I still go for inspiration, or to ch chase down a seasonal ingredient before it is gone. It is hard to walk through the lush aisles in the months of August and September when the harvest is at its peak, vegetables breaming in technicolor, and not want to cook until the end of days. But I cannot simply do this for my own indulgence. I have to calculate if I can afford a product. A cauliflower for $6 to feed four people seems like a small healthy treat. But a cauliflower at $6 for 100 people is a different story. Sorry. We will... A different... Uh, oh, did I miss something? No. <laughs> but for a different story. We will get... Will we get our return? What if there is waste? Or if the cooks burns it? I also have to think of our clients will see the value in the cauliflower. The market is a means to an end. But I have to admit, the means of the John Talon market has become more difficult over the years. To just get in and out has become more difficult. Although I am fortunate to have our restaurant close to the market, and I can often take my bicycle for small quantities, I still have to calculate how much I can carry on my bike, and how long I'll take up to make the purchase. For most chefs, the countdown clock to service begins when they wake in the morning. Every minute of every hour is important. In the, years, in the past years, the market was far more accessible by car, something you need to buy for restaurant quantities, and parking was more abundant on street levels. Yes, the hassle of going downstairs with your boxes is a deterrent. It used to be a guaranteed quick and worthwhile stuff stop if I went before noon. Not anymore. I sadly admit the market as a necessary I sadly see the market as a necessary hurdle as a business person. As I said before, I still use it, but only less so. And most of what I get from the market is delivered so I can avoid the hassle. I know I'm not the only chef who shies away from the Jean Talon market today. Chefs are proud to have it, and we see it as a vital food culture of, of Montreal. I personally encourage many tourists I meet at my restaurant to go and check it out, taking up the abundance. As we all know, the Jean Talon market does not appear to be missing any clients. It is packed all summer and all autumn long. But it should be noted, for every restaurant that buys a case of cauliflower, it's equivalent of 10 to 15 clients making a purchase at any given time. Mm -hmm. Moreover, by receiving deliveries from the market rather than purchasing on site, this limits the amount of secondary purchases. I may go for cauliflower, but my eye is also struck by corn at its peak. Corn. Corn, yeah. With a C, with a C, yeah. <laughs> For me, the Jean Talon market's biggest change in character came when Sammy Fruitery moved out of the market. For those who are not familiar with Sammy's, it is a fruit and vegetable store that served uh, every non-occidental co uh, community in the island of Montreal. It served every non-occidental community in the island of Montreal. 
It had literally piles of fruit and vegetables at incomprehensibly low prices. Famous for 20 limes for one dollar. It was also impossible to spend more than twenty dollars in one shopping trip. It had 15 cashiers you could get in and out very fast. This was not a place for tourists, but a place for the everyday shopper on a budget. Sammy has about three locations around Montreal, but the Jean Talon market, market was the most central. When Sammy's closed, you had the feeling that the market was changing from a place of daily shopping to a destination for foodies and tourists, which is fine. I mean, I'm one of them. <laughs> sure, people in the hood use it as a store, but, for the, but it's mostly for a weekly outing. Another thing that was lost when Sam, the closing of Sammy's was over the ethnic diversity. There is still lots of ethnic diversity, but the day-to-day -day functions of the different cultures coming into the market did seem to, to dissipate. You can get all those foods and at the restaurants and the stores, as, as uh, Susan was mentioning, but it's really has, the character has changed. What I worry about, about that is that these meeting place and sharing of knowledge as the market may become a little more affluent, which is fine, markets do that, that's what a market does, and becomes a little more homogenized, that we may be losing something in that original beautiful exchange that was going on at the origins of the market. Not to be a damper on the Jean Chalon market, I love it, but it's something to be thought about because these places are living knowledge, wealths of knowledge that um, uh, accidentally do so, and they can be lost. All right, so thank you so much, and thank you for your patience. Our next panelist is a vendor, a real-life vendor. <laughs> we had, I had a vision of a vendor that would be in carrots or potatoes. This man is in spices and oils. Is that correct? Spices. He's going to tell us more. Uh, Eric de Vienne uh, received his immersion in seasonings beginning, he tells me, at the age of five months. <laughs> That's when his parents, Chef Philippe de Vienne and his mother, Ethne Grimes de Vienne, took him on one of their regular food purchasing trips and they go all over the world. Uh, their shop in the Jean Talon market is called Epice de Cru, and he has been trained by mom and dad to know his spices, his teas, and his oils, and he'll tell us that there's some other foods in there too. He's also worked as a sous chef for his father in the shop's cooking school, and I hear he's going into pottery as a sideline. He's already in it. <laughs> He sees the market as a foodist hub of producers, vendors, and shoppers. And he's going to tell us about it. This seems to be the one that works. Yours should yeah. work. Yeah. Mine should work. Yours should work, yeah. Do you guys hear me? Yep. Let's try, let's try them first. Let's try that. Yep. Is that good? Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Um, yeah, well, the perspective of a vendor, I mean, I have to admit, um, for me, it was. It was quite different because I, um, I was a traveler. I, my, my parents um, started their food endeavors in a very um, bizarre way because uh, my father about food and talking with people as well as traveling all over the world 
um, is that no matter where you are, no matter what the cultural differences are, you gotta eat. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I knew for a fact that no matter where life took me, if I was in a market, I was safe. <laughs> um, the first day usually involves, um, you know, either getting over jet lag or, you know, getting enough gusto to step out the door and finally say, I can do this. And usually I end up at a market. I remember one specific occasion. I was seven years old and we went to Mexico. And we arrived in Oaxaca very, very, very late at night. And it was very intimidating and, you know, the language was foreign to me. Um, it was extremely hot and I just remember panicking and my mother just trying to calm me down. And the next morning, uh, I was just not having it. And finally, my mother said, okay, that's it. I'm taking him to the Mercado. And she took me to the main uh, Oaxaqueño market, which is one of the largest ones and oldest ones in the city, during the big um, breakfast bout before everyone goes to school and goes to work. And I remember just walking up to this, I'm not even confident I can call it a stall. It was just this makeshift of like wood panels and benches and stuff. And I remember getting uh, huevos rancheros uh, with some wonderful freshly made tortilla and a cup of traditional Oaxaqueño cacao, the real stuff, the real good stuff. And I remember drinking that and eating that, and that's when I got it. And that's when I understood that no matter where I was, if my northern star was always going to be a market. Um, which was interesting because later on in life, um, I had a very interesting uh, introduction, shall we say, to Marché Jean Because the Jean market, when I arrived, um, had just done its major uh, renovation, which was in 2005? Four, 2004. 2004. <laughs> and it was literally, I showed up there uh, not knowing what to expect. I knew there was a market, I knew I could get there by metro. I was good. And when I arrived, um, it was really the conjunction of all the old Italian merchants and all the, the, the vegetable salesmen and the magache who had been there forever and this newly confection built market. And I remember the fear uh, between the merchants and the new storekeepers. There was a bit of a dichotomy with that and eventually it was, it was so beautiful to see just modern and uh, more traditional just kind of gel and congeal and find out that you know your fellow merchants and neighbors were really people that you could have not just conversations with about food or learn about produce or learn about different cuts of meat or <coughs> anything that was biodynamic. It, it's, it's, it's alive. It's a place where you can live. Um, it's a place that I discovered is my best therapy. Um, it's my happiest place to work. It's my happiest place to wind down. It's my happiest place to take my friends and my family. Uh, it's a place where I met the love of my life. Um, hey, it counts for something. Um, and it really, for me, I mean, apart from being a merchant and, and, and going to the store every day and doing the usual grind and making sure that your staff is where they need to be, the one thing that I know for a fact is for markets wherever they are in the world is that these, these places are alive. These places are alive. These places are, are vibrant. These places are exciting. Um, as Julian mentioned, I mean, you said I'm starting to get into pottery. I'm, I, I started a, a decade ago, but it's funny because um, I actually work in ceramics. I have a small ceramic studio here in Montreal, um, and the market really became a platform uh, where our parents, ever, ever ready business people, um, talk to my, myself and my older sister Marika. And they said, you know, basically the two of you don't know what you're doing. You're 16 and 18, and you know you're working at your parents' shop. And like, you know, what do you want to do with your life? And I knew I wanted to be an artist. I wanted to do pottery. And my sister knew that she loved tea. That's all she knew. She said she didn't know what to do with it. So they said, well, figure it out. <laughs> two years later, she opened a tea shop. Oh. Three years later, I got my diploma in ceramics, and I was selling uh, teaware. Oh. It became a really interesting platform, and I mean, I, I couldn't have predicted this. Like, no, no one thinks about, first of all, getting a diploma in ceramics, <laughs> and then after that, actually being able to really present this uh, to a public. Um, and the market is just so vibrant and so alive that you realize that there are people who are art fanatics, or there are people who are even theater fanatics. This is a fun fact, and I'm just going to 
chime this in for you guys. There is actually a secret theater, uh, theater troupe at the market that not a lot of people know about, but I'm going to tell you. Um, it's a small, um, small part of the theater production company. They call themselves Red Row Buff. Um, and they actually do all off-Broadway plays at the market. Um, but they also uh, showcase it in different theaters around the city. If ever you're interested, I did bring a few pamphlets for them. But I actually met um, these actors. I didn't know what they were doing, and I really just thought that one of them was crazy because he was talking to himself. Turns out he was just running over his lines. And I was, like, <laughs> I was like, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm running my lines because we're getting a show tonight. Oh, I'm like, where? He's like, over there. I'm like, <laughs> behind the watermelon stall? Why? <laughs> <laughs> and it was strange because um, it really became this kind of little like speakeasy moment, like you know, after the, mar the market after dark turns into this wonderful theater um, place. Um, so as an artist, as a merchant, as a, as a Montrealer, it's, it really is a place that I'm proud to call home. And it's a place that I think um, has shown a form of resilience through the times. And I don't think that we should be scared of evolution. I mean, I think that we've been speaking about different merchants who do local produce as a spice importer. It's not local. <laughs> and yet what's interesting is that we've been able to mesh and meet different people from different, different experiences, different agricultural backgrounds, and they get excited. So, I mean, the only thing that I can say about the Marche Jean Talon is that it really is a magical place, but it's, she's got a personality, she's got fire, and she's a lot of fun. And if you're bored and you're in doubt of, like, of what to do anything, you'd be surprised what walking through a market can do for you, even if you just pick up a basket of strawberries and go see a secret theater show. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's pretty much it. Well, could you just tell us what is different in in basically a fresh food market to having it maybe on St. Catherine Street. Oh, it's wow. the kind of shopper you get. The the oh the, the kind of shopper I get. The kind of shopper I get. First of all, the, the kind of shopper I get is hungry. <laughs> um, no, which isn't I think is an important thing to 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 underline because if we were let's say on. I don't know, on Sherbrooke Street or uh, on St. Catherine or one of the larger uh, streets, um, I think that first of all, that magic, you just kind of lose it. It just kind of gets diluted. Um, you're in like fake personality world. I think that the market is someplace so genuine. And having a shop there, having the type of shop that we have, we, there, there was no market plan for this. I mean, how do you market selling spices? There's no way of doing it, and yet somehow we showed up at Marché Jean Talon, and it was the clients that told us what we needed to do. Um, the shopper that we get is someone who's hungry. The shopper that we get is someone who's genuinely attached to what they, they, they consume, what they share with their families. Um, and it's people who don't fit into one box. They don't want the the good food lifestyle. They don't want a cardboard box being delivered to their house um, and you know, hopefully putting a recipe together and like, oh wow, isn't it great, I, I, I did it. It's like, well, okay, that's one way of doing it. Um, or, you know, wind down, go there after work or go there before work, even if it's just 20 minutes, walk around, smell, breathe, taste, talk, learn, argue, anything, just get that Get that fire in your belly. You don't have to only feed yourself with food. You need to feed yourself with something else. And I think that's what I've learned about being a shopkeeper in, in Jalfano, is that if I had this very same shop anywhere else, it, it, it wouldn't be our family store. It wouldn't be our story. It would be just a regular chain, and we would, we would lose that dynamic. I think that the market gives as much as she gets. Hmm. And we should we should really nurture that as much as possible. Thank you. Now the man who came in the right suit, isn't that great? Uh, is, no, David, you're never going to do this to me.
again. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you're white, eh? <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. I've been for years. <laughs> Oliver DeVolpe is the executive chef of McGill University's food service. And he's not just a, a commercial <coughs> kitchen type guy. He did, he did his uh, training in smaller places. He's a graduate of ETHQ, the chef school, and the Laurentian one in uh, St. Adele, the uh, Ecole Hotelier de Laurentides. And he worked in good Montreal restaurants before coming to McGill a decade ago, he told me. He shops locally for McGill for about 50% of his food. I think that's remarkable, because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you're dealing with winter. <laughs> and he calculates he has more than 100 local farmers and other producers as regular suppliers. He gave me this staggering number of foods from, uh, that come from McGill's farm at the McDonald campus. 60,000 pounds of fruit and vegetables and more than 100,000 fresh eggs each year. Oh, or tell, you how, tell us how you do it. Well, you have one. Does oh. yours work? I don't know. Do you hear me? Yes. No. Yes. no. Just give me a second. Try again. Yeah. Do you hear me now? Me no. yes. Yes. No. I'm not an all for singer. That's the problem. <laughs> okay. Okay. You can try that one. Well, we'll try with this one. Um, so before I start, I just want to say to uh, uh, Rick that um, uh, he talked about not marketing. I have to say his parents have been incredible marketers for the school. <laughs> I, I watch NBC and I watch these uh, local programs on, on food and stuff like that. And I see Philippe de Vienne and family uh, on such a regular basis that I go into the, the shop on a, on a regular enough basis. Funny enough, I was just saying to uh, Rick that my wife actually worked for Philippe de Vienne 25 years ago, so in a small world. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm the executive chef from McGill University. Um, when, when I started 10 years ago, we were sort of at a turning point where McGill hadn't done anything in food for, for you know, 20 years, 30 years. And it, it was some easy changes. Um, I had been a chef at uh, some restaurants that focused on local cuisine, so I brought in this um, selection of suppliers, um, farmers and stuff like that, many of which who I had met through the different markets over the years. Um, we talked about McDonald campus just because it's one of the highlights of what we're doing, but um, the hundred suppliers are the, the more interesting and the more the more dynamic part, what took a lot more work. McDonald campus was a very simple thing. I met the, the horticulture technician out there, which for anyone else is a farmer. Um, and <laughs> this was two or three weeks after I started and all we knew at that point uh, after meeting was that we needed to start doing something together or in two or three years time, people would be criticizing us for not doing anything. So that relationship developed very quickly. They brought us to some of those numbers that you're, you're seeing. But um, we've talked a lot about Marche Gentilon, and I just want to say that in my you know, 20 years or 15 years before coming to McGill, where I had influence over purchasing and stuff like that, um, Fromagerie at Water, um, Les Cochons Tout Home, these places are, are landmarks in, in the different markets. Um, Robert Desmarais, who produces Jerusalem artichokes or sunchokes and, and, and carrots, I mean, that's all he produces, is an interesting one. Uh, I met our maple syrup supplier um, at one of the markets and she supplies us with about $25,000 uh, worth of maple syrup a year. And I can tell you that McGill University is the only place that we will never serve table syrup. When you come to McGill, you're going to be eating your pancakes and your waffles with real maple syrup. Just part of you know, that Quebec culture and, and this local, local purchasing initi initiative. But cheeses, I mean the most wonderful cheeses that we've not talked about at these, uh, at these markets and stuff. And I can go on for a while, but I, I guess what I, I really want to talk about when the subject of the market was, was put on to me was sort of two parts. And I didn't know where these conversations were going to go, <coughs> so I sort of you know, prepared some vague statements about these two things. One of them is the inspiration as a chef, and I, I can say that David you know, was touching some of that, but if you ever need inspiration, it really isn't long when you're walking through Atwater Market, Jean Talon Market, and these places, and even markets elsewhere in other countries. To me, 
limiting myself to what I can purchase is, is the biggest challenge. But seeing these fresh fruits and vegetables and these interesting, you know, meats and these producers that are doing them and proud of what they're they're doing is an, in, you know, an all-inspiring. Uh, uh, initiative, if you want, an all-inspiring moment for me. Um, the best description I can give of, of the market, and I, I want to play off of what David's little mistake was when he said uh, um, corn and not porn, was <laughs> to me, um, the markets are honestly uh, orangey in, in, in the food world. <laughs> there, there's no better way of describing it. You, you see this, this Know, foods from all over and from uh, all all aspects and freshness and and colors and stuff like that and it, it really is an inspiring thing for uh, a chef so if you've ever felt that you didn't want to cook one night or one week or you didn't know what you were going to do for someone coming over in a few days I, I can only say take that walk through it, it's just a, a very simple thing for me <coughs> Uh, it inspires me as a chef, it gets me back into cooking. I always purchase a, a ton of stuff of all sorts of things and uh, bring them home only to be criticized for buying you know, probably too much. <laughs> um, but the other aspect that I, I want to touch on because as I said, David you know, and even some of the other panelists, uh, Susan, uh, spoke about this inspiration so I don't want to rehash that part. Um, I'm into institutional cooking. There's no, there's no hiding it. We prepare, you know, ten to twelve thousand meals a day for students like Colin Backrow, who, who used to live in residence and would eat, you know, three meals a day, to students that are just passing by in, in some of the outlets. Um, the advantage I have is that when I see something that I like, I'm able to offer or to extend that sort of partnership to these people some of which are unable to take, take on the challenge of the size that we are, but many of which who become our suppliers, and we're so proud you know, to be showing them off. So those trips to the market are sometimes uh, uh, selfish ones where I'm there on business and I'm there to you know, buy the whole uh, crate, the whole forklift full of, um, of um, Honeycrisp apples because you know they're the last ones of the year and the students uh, love them and we want to show them off to again you know finding some of our cheese suppliers when we talk about Fromagerie Saint Guillaume and even the relationship we have with you know some of the bigger ones when we talk about you know uh, Agopurel and, and, and tasting some of the things that um, Agopurel has to offer. Um, again following these three other panelists hard for me to, to touch on much more but um, there are many markets, you know, jean Market Market's been the one touched on most of, uh, of all. I live near to Atwater Market, and I can only tell you that my visits there are probably a little bit more only because of proximity than they are to jean Market. Market. Mm -hmm. But I've been out at the one at, at um, um, down uh, in the East End, I'm trying to remember. That, that, thank you very much. And, um, and, other other places. So, the name of the market or the location of the market, I would say, is really irrelevant to all this. It, you know, they each have something special to offer. It's really connecting with your food and connecting with these vendors and, and inspiring you. Um, there's we talked just quickly a little bit about this becoming a, a little bit more expensive, a little bit more touristy, and stuff like that. But I'll tell you, uh, the markets were never meant or for me, were never meant to um, appeal to the, the shopper of, and it's not to criticize Super C, but if you're buying your corn at Super C, you know, jean Tano Market is not for you. Um, I really love that I go to um, Le Roi de, de, de la Maïs, because my wife thinks it's the best, to buy our corn is, all uh, through. Is, well, yeah. uh, of course. So my wife thinks it's the best, so whether I do or not, or whether I see it somewhere else, that's where I buy it, just so I can come home and, and confirm that's where it came from. They have the two color, but they also have the old yellow. fashioned all yellow. Yes. Yeah. And there's a vendor in Atwar as well. And it just is such fun to have that option. I have, to, I have to agree, if you haven't had the yellow in a while, please go out and get it. This is what corn is supposed to be. Uh, they both have something to offer, but please, you know, go try it. Um, yeah, so, 
I mean, that was the point of the story, is that it has, it has become maybe more expensive than, than some of the alternatives, but it's because we're usually shopping for higher quality products where they're a little bit fresher, a little bit more unique uh, than, than what else is available in those you know, large grocery stores that are, are near you. Um, I, I really thought I was going to be talking less and taking you know, more questions, so I'm going to pass this on, but thank you all very much. We are going to have questions now, and surely in this food, uh, foodie audience there are going to be some questions. Anybody brave enough? Sure. Oh, right in the front row. Okay. The, the one, the maize, yes. where are they? Is it more than one? <laughs> <laughs> can, can you hear the question? Yeah. 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 It's, it's right in the middle. It's Jean Talon Market. It's the third up. Hey, Do you guys want the exact clip? Because I can tell you. <laughs> Get out your GPS. <laughs> yes. The exact location is so when you're in Jean Talon, it's actually really funny. It's basically yeah. just a, it's like a checkerboard. So it's in the third alley, which is right in the middle. Yeah. Um, but you have to, it's moved this year. It's going to be on the right hand side, and not on the left. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, there's one surefire way of finding it. It's the only business that has a dump truck full of corn. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to say that I actually met the Roi de, de, de la Maïs when I was living in Laval, and I actually shopped at a very small market out there, the 440. And the Roi de Maïs was out there as well. So oh. they're not a small corn producer, but they're a very good one. Do you think the, the Marché de l'Ouest? Um, it, it's possible. I wouldn't go off of it, so. At Atwater, it's right down at the bottom, just outside the Premier Moisson store. There was a question over here. Yes. You'll have to show. Yes, hi. Um, I actually worked as a dietitian, and I did my degree at the Dawn Campus a long, long time ago. I recently moved downtown, but before that, when I came to Montreal, they used to go down to St. Laurent and find all the stores that disappeared, like all the bakeries. This is what I wanted to go to on my bike. Then I moved around to Atwater and went to the Atwater market. Now I recently moved to Old Montreal. There's a great little uh, market in the summertime on the hill and the La Commune. But I kind of took offense to what you said. Um, that um, people who are living down have a square box and food. I think there's a lot of people who are craving for markets downtown. And um, just because you live downtown, it doesn't mean that you can't have a great experience and, and participate in a market um, atmosphere. So I think downtown is Valerie Fong. I don't agree with everything that she says, but I think that she's very much interested in having markets downtown. And um, people, even your spice store would work well on like Silicon Moon or not for them. There's nothing like that around there except for a lot of smart people. So I think the downtown core really needs a lot more like this. Does Bon Secours have a real farmer's market going right now? No, no, no. Not really, eh? It's Marché des Écusiers. Oh, but anyway, your idea of it being a dietitian, um, the gentleman for the Hill, even 10 to 12,000 students a year, I think it's fantastic that we're using more than we do. This is an issue that I guess about 10 to 15 years Thank you. Sure. Uh, I, I did want to say that I'm going to do my own uh, sales pitch here. It's um, <laughs> the, There's a student group that started a market at McGill. So we have a farmer's market on McTavish. It runs every Thursday. And the reason why I think it's my own sales pitch is I'm lucky enough to be on sort of the board of advisors for this farmer's market, but it also falls under our department. So we help these students manage this market on their own. And the less I'm involved, the better the market is. Uh, but I encourage you to come out. It's very small. There's 10 to 12 kiosks, but it runs through the school year. So it starts at the end of August and goes to for um, two months every Thursday. And they do run a small uh, CSA basket with a couple of vendors during the summer on the Thursdays as well. So if you're in the downtown core and you're looking for that or craving that, well, I can at least help you out on Thursdays. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another question in the back. Yes. Would you please, please yell? <laughs> it's not a question, it's an observation. There's a lovely small homeless market at the Laurier Metro, Thursdays and Sundays throughout the summer. 
There's one on Cotonage too. I yeah. forgot yes. Crow Street. Uh, else. Queen Mary and the Oracle. They sound like And the market at St. Anne de Bellevue is really beautiful. It has an entirely different complexion than the city markets do. It feels more like a, a, a rural farmer's market. Well, the Lachine. Yeah, Lachine is Somebody's old promoting the Lachine market. Yeah. Here. yeah. Old, old fashioned. Yes. In the back there. Yes, please. Uh, thank you very much for your contributions. Um, I'm like really inspired about this kind of like craft in a going to the market and craft in a relationship with the producer, right? Mm -hmm. But there's one problem. Uh, Jean Talon market is not a farmer's market. It's a pump market, which means that some producers, uh, some, some people are just vendors. They don't produce the food. Yeah. But I'm still wondering, is it possible to craft those relationship even though it's not a farmer's market and a public market? And get but Sorry, it is a farmer's market. It's a public market and a farmer's market. And many, it's true that there are, and there is a rivalry between the two kinds of vendors. There are the, um, when I was researching my book, I realized there's a word that you don't want to be called at the Jean Talon market, and it's a revendeur, reseller. So, so there are a few, there are, some of the sellers are, uh, they go to the central market in the middle of the night and they buy produce from elsewhere. But Jean Talon Market has a rule, and it's if, say, for example, right now, asparagus is in season in Quebec. Well, it's against the rules, highly forbidden, for anybody to sell asparagus from Peru or Ontario or anywhere else. So I, I, there is a, and many of the, Many of the vendors are, if they're not the farmer themselves, they're the daughter or the niece or the cousin or the neighbor of the farmer. So I think many of the vendors there still have a vested interest in that food and how it was grown. I, I, I would like to add to this because I, I, I shop at the Jean Talon market in the summer for vegetables. So I haven't been there in a long time because of their spice shop and I learned a lot about spices from them. But I also shop weekly for a lot of my bulk stuff throughout the winter and such at the uh, Marseille Chantrelle. And this is where the big warehouse is. And when you go in there, it is fascinating because you still, so these people, they sell the stuff, at, but they also, they understand it because they're with it all day long. And there you actually see every culture represented in, this, in the city, you'll see uh, nuns running around buying for their place and, and you know all the different ethnic groups coming together and it's it's kind of funny because cilantro or coriander is massive piles of it and the tarragon is just this little thing <laughs> <laughs> you start realizing what people really do eat in the city but I think anybody who is dealing with the food on a regular basis is still having the interaction with who purchase it um, you can't buy a lamb in the city on Greek Easter. It is just impossible. And every butcher shop in the city knows that. And they re and they stock for it. So I, I mean, my story did start with Saint Laurent and talking to the vendors there. And they weren't part of the market in the sense of they weren't farmers. But I think anybody who's dealing, at, like at Eddick's family, like all they've ever done is import. And, and, but they brought a massive amount of knowledge from around the world. And to sit their spice counter is is revolutionary. It's like, oh my god, I didn't realize these things existed. And yet, technically, they're not making it themselves either. So I think you can still uh, uh, get from a lot of people a lot of information. Okay. More questions? All faces are staring at us. Come on. <laughs> hey, there's one. <coughs> Um, I, I don't know if my voice will carry. Well, first of all, a comment. I think we're really blessed in Montreal because we still have public markets. So far. Can you hear her in the back? Can I chant in the back? Yeah, sure. Hand that over. Great. So I was just saying how blessed we are in Montreal that we actually have farmers markets or public markets because in the United States either they're completely gone or on the way out. And because we live here, we don't realize how wonderful it is that we still have access to this. Um, then I have a question for you, and it's related to what the fellow just asked. When you think of public markets, you think that the food that you can buy there is local and fresh, when in fact, uh, more so perhaps at the Outwater Market than at the Jean Talon Market, 
it's often resellers and the, you, you think you're buying something that's local and unless you inquire or you look carefully you discover it's from all of these other countries and so that is really um, disillusioning if I can use that word and I'd like to know why that is. I, I can tell you why. She has sound. You have so, sound. I do? Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, so first of all, there's a way to know what you're, where, you're, where the food comes from. Every single seller who is growing and cultivating and weeding his, own, his or her own fields <laughs> has a sign. They are really, really proud of it. So it will often say, you know, uh, produit d'ici, locally grown. Um, all you have to do is ask a question and you'll know. But the reason... There's a reason I don't really like the resellers myself. There seems something inauthentic about it to me. I turn my nose up at it, except that there's a reason that they're there. I mean, we, we live in a place that's really cold and slightly <laughs> barren for a really long time. So to go to a market, to go to a market in the middle of February or even early March, um, you wouldn't have a lot of time to spend there. You know, there'd be carrots and onions from, and apples from last fall, some cabbage maybe. Um, and the market um, managers made a decision quite a while ago that they would allow these resold goods in order to attract more people to the market off season and also to get more people to spend more time there when they were there to somehow enhance the experience. So I, I think that's what the there's a balance. Right. I'm just going to add it. It's a little bit more than that. It's actually serving the market, right? Mm -hmm. Because I wouldn't go to Marché Jean Delon for three, four months of the year if, again, all I'm getting is, is onions and apples from four months prior. So having some of these resellers there are a service to us uh, as much as it is, you know, uh, an attraction. So. Mm -hmm. Are there other questions, or will we go and have something to eat? <laughs> <laughs> Another one in the front row. Yes. Yeah. Um, you want to me? Sure. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say I was born on the farm in Manitoba, and so um, we were self-sufficient. The only thing that was bought was sugar and salt. Everything else was grown. So I particularly love going to farmers markets and. Um, I had a wonderful experience in the market in Jerusalem where everywhere you go, they invite you to sit down and have tea. So I thought about your sister, actually, that, that maybe that could be a, a good... I, when I came back here, I was so disappointed to, to be back here and just shopping and nobody looking at you and nobody saying thank you or like what the hell with your business. So it's just a little comment that keep up the good work at the market. I'm actually going to follow up on that. Thank you. It's so funny because um, in, in coalition with what you said, which I think is actually a really interesting remark. Um, one thing that happened with my sister, her, 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 she has since moved on. Um, she, she, she actually uh, changed her, her tea shop. This was a few years back. This was our, our endeavor as young business people. Um, mm -hmm. When we did, in fact, uh, do tea tastings and so on, um, it was almost because she had studied in China um, for six years. Um, she was in Suzhou, um, and I was uh, actually in Kyoto studying in Kyoto. So it was strange when we both came back that when you would have the culture of you know making the tea where you know, questioning how you would actually drink the tea and then serving the tea, um, we would just give it to our guests as they would enter the, the store and most of the time people were just confused. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, well, how much is it? It's like, no, I'm just giving you a cup of tea. <laughs> and it was odd to just kind of see, you know, that, you know, you can have a relationship, as you described so well in the market, it's important to maintain those relationships because um, if you take care of your clients, your clients take care of you. And that does not necessarily mean that there has to be uh, money exchanged. And there's so much more than that. So I think, thank you for that value, valuable point. And Natalie wants, has given me a high sign over there. I don't want to invite people to go next door. Well, could I just say thank you a few thank yeah. you? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's my turn now to say some thank yous. I have some gifts for the panelists. And, um, we're going to end with the thank yous by asking a couple of the panelists to talk to you about some things that they brought for you. Because this is the second of the second Foodways event. The first one was um, 
on Jewish foodways, and it was held in Westmount. Um, and we served kosher food, but the bagels were a wee bit stale. And we had a very foodie crowd, and we heard about that. <laughs> this time, we are talking about markets. We have another foodie crowd, and the stakes were really high. <laughs> so I phoned Oliver, and Arik has helped out as well, and we have some much more um, palatable food options today, and I will let them describe it to you. But I'm just going to say a few thank yous because an event like this actually takes a village. There are a huge number of people and this is our last event for the term. So I wanted to say thank you to the panelists for coming. I also wanted to thank the staff members who've helped. And we've had photo contributions for the touch table and the PowerPoint. So thank you to Lauren Goldman, Marika Raimundo. Marika, are you, are you in the back there still? Yes, See? Back there. The person taking photos back there. Mary Yearl, who's our Osler librarian, um, Lisa Moffa, Susan Seminar. We had some wonderful photos for you from your Instagram, I'm afraid. Um, Jacqueline Sunberg, who you've seen in a number of different guises here. Julie Gesbrecht, Ellis Litting, the BNQ, the Archives de la Ville de Montréal, and also the McGill University Archives. I also wanted to, to introduce a wizard to you. Greg, could you put your hand up? Greg Houston is the artist and wizard behind that touch table display. And I was told to say that by Jacqueline, who didn't thank herself, because Jacqueline worked with him to actually assemble those photos. So you have historical photos of the markets, beautifully organized, thanks to Jacqueline and to Greg. So many thanks to you both for that. Um, Jacqueline is also um, another person who you've been seeing behind the sound machines today. She designs all of the posters for our events. She's the wizard behind the whole of a Roar series of events, and we do typically two a month. So huge thanks and recognition to Jacqueline for pulling this together. There are a number of staff members in the room, and I, would you mind just putting your hands up if you were a librarian or a library staff member? Wow. So there are actually a number of people in the room. Um, they're not required to be here. They're here but out of interest. They're here to help. Sitting at the reception desk is the head of rare books back there. The, the rare books librarians around in the back of the room. So many thanks to the, uh, the library staff who've supported these events and shown incredible enthusiasm for coming out. And it's really a delight. We also kept the dean of the library here for the whole event. <laughs> Did you notice? Yeah. And, and she wasn't sure she was staying, but she clearly got very interested in it. Come back for future events. We do events um, all the time. In the fall, we actually have Alberto Mangel coming, the bibliophile. So he's going to do a series of conversations with guests. We have confirmed um, Aretha Van Herk already and André Michaud to talk about detective fiction. And on September the 19th, we have an expert in practical jokes who's going to come. <laughs> so our, our kickoff talk is actually going to be about practical jokes. She will split our side. So um, get tuned for that in the fall. So do enjoy, during the reception, do enjoy looking at the touch table, looking at the images here, and also looking at our pop-up exhibit. Many thanks to everyone for organizing that. And I'm now going to turn the mic over as the last hurrah to Oliver and then to Ari to tell us a little bit about what they brought because they, they made some careful choices. I, I don't know so much about careful choices. It was more about uh, feeding uh, a group of people. Um, the one thing that I, I would like you to um, look for and taste if you, if you, if you choose is we brought out one of our new initiatives. It's um, a kombucha, so for people that are, but this is kombucha with apples, actually Royal Gala apples from the farm. So you'll see a McGill logo on it. You'll see, you know, these apples came from the farm and, and we started doing this. In the fall, we'll see some with uh, plums and again with apples and, and stuff like that. So just one more of these little initiatives that connect us back to McDonald campus and, and our sort of uh, local purchasing uh, initiatives. Thank you. Really 
pretty short and sweet because you guys probably want to go eat. So uh, I brought one thing. It's possibly for the more adventurous crowd. Um, it's a traditional Mayan dish from the regions of Mexico. Actually, the real reason I brought it, one, it's delicious. <laughs> Two, between allergies and gluten and sugar and stuff, I said, I'm going to go with something old-fashioned. So it's called Sikilpak. It's actually a roasted pumpkin seed and cured tomato like puree. It's very rich in protein. It's extremely, extremely aromatic. It's yes, it's spicy, <laughs> and you will survive. Um, and if, if you guys just want to give your give your tongue a little bit of a, I can go try it out. It's on the table there. <laughs> So let's celebrate the end of term.